Leaders Organization Digital Events. We're happy you could be here with us um, this morning. Glow is committed to continue to bring you quality content so that you as a business leader and a business owner can continue to not only survive through this difficult time, but to thrive. We want you to continue to grow your business. I'm very excited. We're gonna play a video to give an intro of Molly Bloom. So play the video, please. I'm Molly Bloom. Do you know about me? This is a true story. You ran games in LA for roughly eight years? Yeah. And then you ran games in New York for roughly two. I haven't run a game in over two years, not to spoil the ending. But that's when the government raided my game and took all of my money, assuming all of it was made illegally, which it wasn't. In this room, you couldn't buy your win. I'm all in. You couldn't buy me, and you couldn't buy a seat at the table. Movie stars, athletes, billionaires, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You're not taking percentage of the pot? No. Keep it that way, because you don't want to break the law when you're breaking the law. Am I breaking the law? Not really. We're able to find out for sure, aren't we? Laws are written down. You had meetings in LA about your book and life rights. I did. You spent eight years running the world's most exclusive, glamorous, and decadent man cave. Any office? Guarantee the publishers certain elements, then I can get you a million and a half. What kind of elements? I passed. I'm just curious as to why you passed and what would appear to be the only way out you have. You have to use real names. Creative differences. The law that I'm accused of breaking defines gambling as betting on games of chance. Yes. Poker isn't a game of chance, poker's a game of skill. Why does a young woman who at 22 has a gold-plated resume, why does she run poker games? Your risk is nuts. You're gonna get blown up. You got 2.8 million on the street right now. That money should be in your hands. Just how deep into the Russian mob were you? There's a new offer on the table. Complete immunity. We hand over the hard drive. You've seen what's on those hard drives. Families, lives, careers will be ruined. Why are you in this alone? Where are the people you're protecting by not telling the whole story? It's not their names. I'm protecting Charlie. It's mine. Tell me why! Because it's all I have left! Because it's my name! Hi everyone, I'm Molly. How are we doing? It's a little bit of a different question these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here with you all um, to share my story and to share uh, this playbook that I derived from being um, a master of disaster. I have had a lot of disaster in my life, a lot of crisis, um, some my fault, some not. And so I think it's a really relevant time to kind of share what the, the skill set and the, the ideology I've developed to get through all of that. But first, I'm going to start with the story and I'll jump right in. Um, I was born in a small town in Colorado. It's called Loveland, Colorado. And I was the first born daughter to two parents who were really serious about their role of, of raising humans. My mom stood on her platform and wanted us to be good people. She taught us that our name mattered and that we should walk through life with integrity and with kindness. My dad, on the other hand, was insistent that we walk through fear. He taught us about constructive suffering, which aka discipline, and um, the pursuit of excellence. So as you can see, things were going very well for me. And then my brothers were born and they ruined everything. And they ruined everything. <laughs> they ruined everything, not just because they were born, but they were born into a family that absolutely uh, took academics and sports very seriously, and they were two little prodigies. Uh, my youngest brother, Jeremy, uh, was the athletic prodigy. And from day one, this kid was just, a, he was a phenom. And he went on to win six world championships, compete in two Olympics. And then when he decided to retire from his skiing career, he casually went to the NFL combine, ran a 4-3-40 and got drafted fifth round of the Philadelphia Eagles. So this is little brother. Um, he also started a charity granting wishes for senior citizens in our community. He was like an Abercrombie model. And most recently he's raised a bazillion dollars for a tech startup. So that's Jeremy. My middle brother, uh, Jordan, 
was the genius, is the genius. He was beating my fa parents in chess at like four, maybe seven, I don't know. Um, <laughs> felt like four. He was testing out of his math class and into mine, getting better scores. And he went on to become a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon. So this is my dinner table, you know? I'm never gonna be the smartest or most talented person in the room. Um, and that kept me up at night. And so what I decided from a really young age or what I developed was this mindset of like, I'm just never gonna quit. I'm just gonna keep going at it until I break down these walls. And the first place I applied that to was my ski career. I too wanted to go to the Olympics and um, I was competing locally and doing well. Um, and then at 12 years old, I got diagnosed with really severe scoliosis. And the doctor sat me down and they said, look, you have to have this surgery because if you don't, you will become disfigured and eventually suffocate to death. And the surgery is gonna consist of taking bone out of your hip, putting it in between your top 11 vertebrae so that it fuses into a solid bone and putting two metal rods down the side. And then the last thing they said really pissed me off. They said, uh, and so you should probably find a new hobby. So I got the surgery. Um, I took the year off of school. I was homeschooled. I let the, the fusions heal. But at the end of that year, I was back on the snow. And I worked really hard over the next eight years. I showed up early to training and I left late. And I learned about playing hurt and constructive suffering. And at 19 years old, I made the US ski team. At 20, I was ranked uh, number three overall in North America. And at 21, I made it all the way to the Olympic qualifiers. And I stood on top of that mountain thinking of all the sacrifices, all the pain, all the blood, sweat, and tears, and, and thinking this is the moment of your life. Please don't mess it up. And this is what happened. It's a video. So we're gonna wait just a second. There we go. Ready? Good snow contact, calm upper body, legs together, good shape, no line deviation. Set up for the D-spin and stick the landing. Now two things you need to know before the second trick, which will be a 720. The first is that when visibility is bad the way it is now, race officials toss pine boughs on the course so the skiers have some foreground depth reference. The second is that the tightness of your bindings is determined by what's called a din setting. If you're a beginner, your din setting is probably a two or three. If you're an experienced weekend skier, it's probably seven or eight. Mine's 15. My boots are basically welded to my skis, right? So how does this happen? It happened because I hit a pine bough that had become frozen in the snow. And I hit it so precisely that it simply snapped the release of my bindings. Right in that moment, I didn't have time to calculate the odds of that happening because I was about to land pretty hard on my digitally remastered spinal cord, which was being held together by spare parts from an erector set. So I retired from skiing that day. And it wasn't because I didn't show up or prepare or work hard. It was because I tripped on a stick. And uh, sometimes that happens in life. I was in my final year at the University of Colorado. I had just taken the LSATs. For those of you that have seen the movie, Aaron Sorgan massively inflated my LSAT score. But, <laughs> but I did quite well and I was applying to some top tier law schools. But I sat in that classroom at the University of Colorado and I looked out the window and I could see those mountains and I just, my heart was broken and I just needed a year. So I decided that I was gonna go somewhere warm and just be a kid for a year, just have a very like, you know, no responsibility life. And my parents weren't really down with this. So um, I went anyway, but I had to get a job kind of as soon as I drove in to Los Angeles. And I went to this restaurant to apply and on the application it said must have fine dining experience. Um, well, up until this point, you know, I've been living in, in Colorado and the nicest restaurant I've probably been to is uh, maybe at Chili's. And so um, <laughs> I knew nothing about fine dining, 
And, but I, you know, I'm kind of of the mentality, fake it till you make it, just jump in and, you know, change lanes, look after. So I, I checked yes. And um, I was terrible. And I got fired two weeks later. And my boss said, you're the worst waitress we've ever seen. It's not even worth training you. But we see that um, you're, you know, people like you and you show up to work early and you leave late. And so we want to offer you a job as, as our personal assistant at our real estate development fund. Um, these guys were uh, your kind of staple uh, LA trust fund kids over leveraged, uh, huge egos, would have never survived an HR department. But um, I was out of money and I didn't want to go home. So I said, yes. And I started working for them. And, you know, it was, it was kind of brutal at times, but I was learning a lot. I was, they were master negotiators. There were always deals coming in through the office. And so I just stayed to, to figure it out because I wanted to stay in Los Angeles. So, um, my boss at the time came in the office one day and said something that sounded pretty innocent at the time. He said, I need you to serve drinks tomorrow at my poker game. So, um, are there any, are there any poker players? Okay. <laughs> um, Vince, we can have a virtual poker tournament one of these days for glow. Just kidding. I won't, I won't do that. I won't take that. Um, Anyway, so I knew nothing about poker, absolutely nothing. So I went home and I was Googling things like, what kind of music do poker players like to listen to and what do they eat? And I made this super embarrassing playlist with songs like The Gambler on it. I went to get this cheese plate at the supermarket and um, showed up for the game thinking, how hard can this be? A bunch of overgrown frat boys playing poker on a Tuesday night. And then Ben Affleck walked in the room. And then Leonardo DiCaprio. And then a politician who will remain unnamed. And one after the head of one of the biggest movie studios, the head of one of the biggest hedge funds um, in the world. And, and one after another, these people from um, all different walks of life, but who truly moved the needle on the world stage. And, you know, I had a moment of total mortification about the playlist that I had made and the cheese plate. But as I sat in that room and I was able to be a fly on the wall, um, I thought, there's an, there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity here to have access to this network, to have access to information, to capital and to power, and I wanted to stay in that room. So um, I went home and over the next couple of weeks, I watched uh, poker, how to play poker tutorials. I wanted to learn the rules of the, and the objectives of the game. And then over the next couple of months, I studied the player. I wanted to understand them. I wanted to understand this, which was why these people who could have access to anyone and anything, why they wanted to come play poker consistently every Tuesday night in this dingy club basement with my terrible cheese plate. And what I landed on when I started asking that why is these, this was about more than poker. It was about poker for sure, but it was about more than poker. It was about being part of a community. It was about being part of a mythology. It was about being part of this exclusive club and having this incredible experience where for five hours a night, you could walk out of your life, disappear into another one. And so as soon as I understood it was about experiences and building out that uh, and, and building on that fantasy, I was able to start really conferring value. And I started to uh, become really valuable to the players in the game. And um, some of the players made comments about wanting me to come work for them, et cetera. And my boss got really threatened. So one day he said, I'm taking the poker game away from you. You need to go pick up my dry cleaning and give me the list of who owes what and, and everyone's numbers and contacts. Um, but I couldn't do that because I couldn't unsee what I had seen, which was not only is this a networking rocket ship that everybody wanted to play in this game and whoever held the the keys to this game held a lot of power i also saw that there was a tremendous opportunity to make a lot of money in a short amount of time um people were tipping me up to twenty thousand dollars for just bringing drinks when when people play with chips it's a whole different economic system so um i knew i had to take a shot and so i planned a game for the next week i moved it to the penthouse at the four seasons in los angeles I hired people and had them memorize everybody's favorite drink order, their favorite food order, who they were in the world, what their families' uh, names were, because I've seen that no matter what someone's station in life, 
everybody wants to feel special. Everybody wants to feel seen, heard, and remembered. Um, I raised the stakes. I raised the stakes from ten to fifty thousand um, dollars. I wanted this. Uh, I wanted this game to make noise, and then I used almost all the money I had to stake a professional athlete um, from a winning sports team that year in the game, um, because I also knew that that would create a lot of noise and a, and a big story. And then I invited everyone except for my boss. <laughs> And I knew that this was a long shot. I knew I was going up against the billionaire boys club, asking them to forego one of their own, but I believe in experiences. Players showed up. The night was amazing. There was so much energy. Uh, it was an incredible night. And at the end they said, okay, we'll go with you. And it became my game. And for the next six years, I ran this game. I made millions of dollars. Um, I uh, had an incredible network. I had, an incredible amount of power. Um, and, you know, I, I learned, probably most importantly, I learned that I was an entrepreneur. I learned that I could uh, think quickly on my feet, that I could get creative, that I could problem solve, um, that, I, that I could look at the competition and, and see what they were doing and, and do it better. And it was a very exciting time in my life. Um, at the end of, uh, in the sixth year, I ran into a big problem. I found out that one of the most powerful, one of the most famous uh, players in the game was cheating. And this was a really big dilemma because to call him on it was gonna put me in a lot of danger. This is someone that had a huge ego and a huge amount of power, um, but I had to do it. You know, I couldn't tolerate that, that dishonesty and, and that thievery in the game. So I, I had a talk with him and instead of, you know, I said, look, you got to pay the money back. You got to make it right. And instead of doing that, he went behind my back and he stole the game. And the way I found out about it was the, the following week, he called me and said, don't bother showing up to your game now or ever. It belongs to me now and you're out. So like tripping on a stick in a moment, everything is over. Everything I'd built, uh, this thing that had finally made me feel like somebody in the world. Um, and I was devastated. And, you know, at that point, I could have, should have gone away. I had saved millions of dollars. Um, I had a stellar reputation. I had an incredible network that people would have, you know, paid a lot of money for. But I was pissed. And I felt like there was a whole heck of, of, of a lot of injustice. And that um, propelled me to, to, to not go away, but to go bigger. And so I decided that I was gonna build the biggest poker game in the world to show them. And I was gonna do it in New York City on Wall Street because I thought that, you know, there's a lot of gamblers on Wall Street. Now, the only problem with my ingenious plan was it was 2008. <laughs> so trying to build the biggest poker game in the world on Wall Street in 2008, maybe a little misdirected, maybe a little crazy. But I was fueled with so much anger um, and, and you know, just the injustice of all of it that I just didn't care. And I just put my head down and I got creative and I went into networking overdrive. I hired socialites who you know, knew international millionaires and billionaires to help me recruit. I was incentivizing the mater d's at the high-end uh, restaurants in, in New York. I was incentivizing the concierge at the hotels, the valets at the hotels. I was doing deals with Vegas casino hosts saying, you know, I've got this roster of the biggest poker gamblers in the world. I'll bring them in. They're all, you know, they're celebrities. They can become your clients, but I need a list of the biggest poker players in the country. And so by the end of 2008, I had done it. I had built the biggest poker game in the world in New York City. It was a $250,000 buy-in. It was populated by international billionaires, politicians, Wall Street titans, um, sports stars. And this time I decided I was not gonna be expendable. I was not gonna be replaceable. And I was also not um, going to be, I was going to take the experience a level above and wipe out my competition. And the way that I was gonna do this would, I, was to become the bank. Um, if people were financially enmeshed with you and you were the bank, they couldn't just go away. Secondarily, the one fear and the biggest obstacle to people coming and playing in, in home poker games is this fear that they're not gonna get paid. Um, and so I took away that fear. I became the bank, I vetted the players, I extended credit and I settled the game. And my, 
my thesis was that if people um, wanted, you know, that, that this game would be so good that there would be no alternative and people would have to pay their debts if they wanted to play. And the second, second thing that kept me safe was it was total su social suicide to stiff this game. So this worked. It, it, it made my job a lot more stressful. Um, there was a lot more to it, but this worked. And I wiped out the competition and I not only had um, games that were 250, you know, I, I had all the games. I had the small games, the big games, the PLO games. I ran New York City um, high stakes poker. And um, things were, you know, the, this was really exciting and, and uh, a huge victory. But something started to change in me. And what had previously been about having guts and being an entrepreneur and building a, a sustainable business, a profitable business, became about greed and power and money. And it was never enough. Every night, I, every day and night, I wasn't running one of my games. I was out recruiting for more until I had a poker game running every day and every night of the week. And it was just me financing these games. I didn't have a partner. And um, it became really unsustainable. I had millions of dollars out on the street. I never slept. These games would go all day and all night. And I started taking pills to stay up. I started taking pills to come down. I started drinking way too much to deal with this, this loneliness because my life was all poker all the time. I lost touch with my family because they were really worried about what I was doing and I didn't want to hear it. Um, and I lost touch with my real and good friends, most of them, because I was becoming someone other than I, you know, than they were used to. And so you can see that this uh, train is starting to kind of wobble off the tracks. But don't worry, I have like two and a half years of bad decision making before the whole thing blows up. <laughs> so I was starting to run into problems um, other than the problems within me. Um, on the West Coast, one of the poker players got indicted for running a Ponzi scheme. His name was Bad Brad because in the four years, well, that's what we called him. In the four years that he played in LA poker, he never won, literally never won. He would come and lose hundreds of thousands of dollars every night. And he was great for business, but in those days I still had a moral compass. And so I pulled him aside and I said, look, Brad, I don't think this game is for you. And he said, please don't take my seat away. I love the game. I love the guys. I want to keep playing. And something started to happen at the table. I saw that Bad Brad, although he literally did not know that a, a, a straight beat a pair, um, he was raising a lot of money at the table for his hedge fund. People decided he was some sort of idiot savant. And so they're all investing with him at his hedge fund, which turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. And he was using the game to raise money for the Ponzi scheme. So we all thought we were hustling Bad Brad, but Bad Brad was really hustling us. And he got caught and he you know, was very forthcoming with the feds about this game that he had played in and lost uh, $7 million, et cetera. And um, the consequence of that was the tabloids got a hold of the story because there was a bunch of celebrities playing. And the West Coast feds now understand that there is this game that exists run by this girl named Molly, and, and so they're clocking this. Back on the East Coast, um, I had just recruited what I thought were the recruits of a lifetime. There were these Russian-American businessmen, uh, and I had private investigators that checked everyone out, really good, top-notch private investigators that vetted everybody. I had to, and these, these men, their stories checked out. They were very sophisticated, educated, uh, People loved them, they, they, they meshed with everyone at the, at the poker table well, and all they wanted to do was play poker for the biggest numbers I have ever seen. Um, in these games, I saw someone lose $100 million in one night. And um, so, you know, I, I'm making so much money and, and the games are so rich with action and people are flying in from all over the world to play in these games. And it turns out these guys are not legitimate businessmen, shocker, that they are running the biggest health insurance fraud scheme in New York City history, using the game to launder some money, and that they have deep ties to the Russian mob. So don't ever hire me to recruit for your companies because I accidentally recruited the Russian mob. Um, and uh, you know the feds were listening to their phones, which means now they are 
onto this game and, and listening to mine. And I didn't know any of this at the time, so I'm just proceeding uh, as usual. Um, as I said, I was growing this business um, way, way too big, way too fast. Uh, it was not sustainable. I was getting reckless about who I put in seats. I mean, and when I, when I say reckless, I mean I wasn't 100% sure that they had the finances to be able to uh, play at these, at these levels. I was just, I was trying to fill seats. I was so overextended. And so um, I'll never forget this. I was at the Plaza Hotel running a huge game. There's $20 million at the table and two seats at the table, meaning two players, were stuck a huge amount of money that I didn't think that they could cover. So I started doing the one thing that I told my attorneys I would never do, which is take a rake. That means take a percentage of each pot or act as, as Vegas does, because that's one of the things that would put me in direct violation of the federal statute. Up until this point, I was doing things legally. It was definitely not the clearest uh, line, but it was, but I was on the right side of it. I was paying my taxes. I had incorporated and I was just existing based on tips, but people knew that if they wanted to play, if they wanted to get credit, they needed to tip a percentage of their winnings, a, a sizable percentage of their winnings. So I was making between five and $7 million a year, you know, with, with this structure. Um, but I, I started to need to cover my downside because I was getting sloppy. And so I started taking a rake. And the feds had put a confidential informant in the game by this time because of the, uh, the Russians. And so now I'm violating the federal statute. And the last thing that happened before this whole thing blows up was I had a little run in with the Italian mob. You know, listen, I had seen Goodfellas. I had seen the Sopranos. I know I, I knew the way it went in the movies that the mob runs gambling in New York City. But I was so far removed from that. I was running these games with billionaires and with, you know, uh, politicians and on the Upper East Side. And I just didn't think there was crossover and they didn't feel the same. So they came to me, they got to me um, and they said, basically, you know, it's great what you've been able to build. But if you want to continue to operate, you need to go into business with us. We need to partner. Um, and I politely declined their offer and left and um, started just kind of evading their calls. And unfortunately, they did not go away. It was around the holidays and I lived in a very secure, beautiful building on the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan. And so when there was a knock at the door around the holidays, I thought it was a doorman bringing up some packages. And instead there was a strange man outside my door. And uh, this is what happened. You're in the wrong. Place. Wait, okay. hold on a second. I have. Not as calm. You get me? I have money. It's all cash. Where? It's safe. Where is it? Money and jewelry in a bag. Gold bars, too. Come on. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. It wasn't an offer they made, it wasn't a suggestion. This will be your only reminder. Your mother lives alone in Telluride, Colorado. Right? <coughs> right? Right, Molly? She doesn't live there anymore. Yeah, she does. <gasps> So as you can see, things got really dark and really dangerous. 
and I was terrified and I didn't know what to do. I didn't call the cops because I was afraid of them. I was afraid of what they would do to, um, to my family or to myself. And so I stayed in my apartment and I let my face heal and I waited for their phone call. And I had no idea what I was gonna say to them. They had just made it really clear that turning them down wasn't an option. And I could not believe that this is where I, I, my life was and this is what I had done. So I waited for them to call, a week went by, two weeks went by, I didn't, I didn't uh, hear from them. On the third week, I got my answer. On the cover of the New York Times, it said 125 arrested in the biggest mob-related takedown in New York City history. And so um, I never heard from them again. But let me paint you a picture here. On the West Coast, we've got Ponzi schemes and very high profile celebrities playing in an illegal, now illegal poker game. On the East Coast, we have Russian mob, Italian mob. I have, I'm taking a rake and politicians, uh, Wall Street titans, um, celebrities all playing in this illegal poker game and it's all connected by me. So I'm sure you can guess who came into the, uh, the scene next, it was the feds. I got a text message from my poker dealer in 2011 and they said, uh, the FBI is here looking for you, don't come here. And in that moment I knew it was over. And in that moment I wanted my mom and I wanted Colorado. And so I went to my apartment and I threw together a bag of my stuff um, and I headed to uh, JFK. And I tried to buy a ticket from JFK to Denver uh, on my, with using my credit card and my card got declined. And then my bank card got declined and they were all getting declined. And I logged into my accounts and I saw that they were all seized frozen, that the account balance read negative $9,999,099. The feds took everything. I made it home, I made it to Colorado and um, <clears throat> my lawyers spoke to uh, the Department of Justice and they said, this is called forfeiture. And a person has presumed innocence, but their property does not. And we believe that she's been making her money illegally, so we took it. If she wants to come in and talk to us about what she knows about organized crime or the people playing in her game or how she's made this money, we can do that. And I certainly did not want to do that. So I went away. I moved back in with my mom, you know, all the games, most of the friends, the penthouse apartments, the Bentleys, all gone. Um, and I felt pretty sorry for myself. And I stayed in bed for a couple of weeks. And finally, my mom came in and said, that's it. You need to go out and get some fresh air. Because I don't know about you guys, but my mom thinks that fresh air will fix anything. <laughs> I went out and I'm at my mom's house right now. And it's, it's in the mountains and it's so beautiful. And it's just surrounded by nature. And, and, and I remember going outside and looking at those mountains and, and kind of remembering, you know. Those were the mountains that I was raised on. And I was raised when you fall down, you pick yourself back up and you keep going. And so I decided I would do that. And the first thing I did is uh, I got sober. I got clean and sober. The second thing I did was I got fully responsible. This mess, this situation I was in was 100% my fault. Nobody twisted my arm. Nobody tricked me into doing this. I wasn't working for someone else. I, this was me. And I needed to do that to be able to move on. Um, <clears throat> and then I started trying to get a job. And that was not an easy feat. You know, no one really wanted to take my phone call. This, this whole thing was being covered by the tabloids. Um, no one knew whether I was working with the, the mob or the Fed. I mean, you know, no one wanted to take my phone call. It took me about two years and I finally got a job. Um, I moved back to LA into this small, modest apartment that looked nothing like my life before, but it was a start. And seven days after I had moved my stuff into this apartment and, and you know, driven across the country, I got a phone call at 4 a.m. And the voice on the other end of the call said, this is agent so-and-so from the Los Angeles FBI. We're outside your door right now and you need to come out or we're gonna break down the door. And in the most surreal moment of my life, I walked into this hallway and I was blinded by these high beam flashlights. And when my eyes normalized, I saw 17 FBI agents, semi-automatic weapons pointed at me and they put me in handcuffs and they put this piece of paper in front of me that said the United States of America versus Molly Bloom, which is super unfair to use at this point. 
And I was, you know, I was being thrown into a, a, a really serious criminal indictment. They took me to jail. My mom had to fly in and, and put up her house to bail me out. And we had a day and a half to get to New York City to find an attorney that's going to represent me in the fight of my life. And I don't have a penny. We found um, a heroic human being named Jim Walden, played by Idris Elba in the film. And um, we started working together. And, um, you know, we, I didn't have enough money to fight this. And also, I was guilty. And <laughs> so um, we went to talk to the prosecutors uh, about making a deal. And the prosecutors were really excited to take this meeting. They had really wanted this meeting. And they said to me, Molly, you ran the, one of the biggest underground gambling syndicates ever uh, for eight years. And it was populated by celebrities and uh, Wall, Street figure, Wall Street heads and, and politicians. And we think that you have information on these people that could help us. We're not interested in the mobsters. We're interested in, in these people. And they said, if you're willing to do this, if you're willing to become a confidential informant, tell us what you know and potentially wear wires to get more information. Um, we're willing to give you all your money back and we're willing to give you full immunity. But if you don't, we believe that your crimes are deserving of real prison time and we would suggest 10 years. So, you know, hard choice. I went home and I thought about this and where I, what I came to was what I'd come to two years before. This was my fault. These were my actions. And I needed to stand for the consequences of my actions rather than pulling these people through the mud who all they had done is show up and, and, and make me a lot of money. I knew a lot of their families. I knew a lot of their kids. And so it just didn't seem like the right choice for me. So I let the, the prosecutors know they were very unhappy and I waited to get sentenced. Um, and I got really lucky that day. I got a judge that was massively disappointed with my life choices. I got a full dissertation on that, but who basically said, I don't think that sending you to prison is, is, is the right thing to do. And so the good news is, is I didn't go to jail. And the bad news is, is I had to go to dinner with my family that night. And Jordan had just graduated Harvard for like the 90th time. And Jeremy had just been inducted into the Colorado Sp Sports Hall of Fame. I'm not even kidding. This is, this is what was happening. And I'm the family felon. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, look, this can't be how this story ends. I need a massive rebranding campaign. And so I went home and I thought, what does that look like? What's, what's the solution here? What's the way out here? And what I landed on is the monetizable asset, the unique asset was the story. So I decided that I would write a book and try to convince a really prolific screenwriter to write a movie. But this was no easy feat. Um, this book and this movie involved some of the most powerful people in the world who seriously did not want the story to be told. And I had no interest in writing a celebrity takedown. I had no interest in, in outing names that hadn't been outed already. And I had no interest in telling the stories that I knew would sell a lot of books, but that would ruin lives. Um, but they didn't know that. So getting a book deal was kind of hard. Um, getting someone to write the movie was near impossible. I kept taking meetings with people that were like, <laughs> no way. You know, this is career suicide. We're not touching this you should just go, you know, give up and try something else. But in my gut, I believed in this. And also I had lost everything. So I was pretty fearless and had nothing to lose. So I just kept bothering people um, and taking meetings until I sort of, what I landed on was, there's a short list of people in Hollywood, writers and directors, that if they take on a project, it gets made. And people are, people don't have the luxury of, of exiling them because they are so important and so integral to making good films. And so I, I made the short list and on the top of the list for me was Aaron Sorkin. He was my favorite writer. He wrote A Few Good Men, The Social Network, Moneyball, The West Wing. You know, I, I just felt that Aaron wrote with a lot of honesty and humanity. And also that from a gambling perspective, he was a great horse to bet on. So I started trying to get a meeting with Aaron. It took me a really long time. I had to bother a lot of people. And finally, I wore someone down and he asked Aaron for a personal favor. And I was told that I'd have one hour to pitch Aaron. And if he was not interested, I could never contact him again. So I, I flew to LA and I, uh, I told Aaron's door, my, 
Aaron Sorkin my story. And he sat there and he listened to me and, and at the end he kind of got this amused expression on his face and he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, kid. I've never met someone so down on their luck and so full of themselves. <laughs> I said, so are you in Sorkin? And he was. And so uh, not only did he decide to write the movie, he decided to make it his directorial debut. And so five years ago, I was pleading guilty in federal court. And last year I got to go to the Oscars. What a country. <laughs> so as you can see, um, I've navigated a lot of disaster. Some my fault, some not. But in surviving these events, surviving myself, I've developed a bit of a playbook that I think is applicable to almost any crisis or any disaster. And we're in a bit of a disaster right now, which is gonna require a lot of people to pick up the pieces, to reinvent, and to defy odds. So it seems very timely to share this. So the first kind of play in the playbook um, was to get radically responsible. Um, to get radically responsible cannot change the circumstances we are in presently. I spent too many nights wishing I had chosen a different line at the Olympic qualifiers. Too many nights wishing that I hadn't, uh, you know, taken a rake in poker, but that was completely futile. So I realized that I needed to get completely 100% responsible for what happens to me in my life. And that was a huge shift. I went from being powerless to powerful. The second play is to get still. And what I mean about by this is to be able to disconnect from the external uh, friction and the internal friction. Uh, when I you know, was trying to get this movie made, not only was the world telling me that it wouldn't work, inside my head, I also had this, this fear dialogue, this, this doubt dialogue, this shame dialogue. And so I realized I needed to clean it up and I needed to move that center within and I needed to get really still. And the thing that I found to do that uh, is meditation. And meditation gets stigmatized as this very spiritual woo-woo practice, um, you know, this, this way to a monastic life. And I, I'm, sure, I'm sure those are all great applications, but in my experience, meditation is the most profound performance tool I have ever encountered. Um, and, you know, an, another thing that I love about science is it's quantifiable. It's backed by, si it's, it's backed by science. You can see the difference in a brain scan before and after someone uh, engages in an, an eight-week meditation class. Course. You can see that there's an increase in the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your, the brain that's responsible for executive functioning, problem solving, and a decrease in the gray matter in the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that's associated with fear, worry, anxiety. It's science. And in my experience, meditation um, totally rewired my brain um, and allowed me to have manual control over what I focus on, as opposed to it just going this monkey mind and deciding what, what I focus on. I think meditation makes you dangerous. I think it makes you extraordinarily powerful. And it also helps you when you quiet that mind, it helps you to find the answers within. In my experience, the answers to a problem, to a crisis, to life are already inside of us. If we can just quiet the noise and listen to our intuition. The third play in the playbook is to get fearless. Um, now, you could argue I took this too far, so let me make a caveat here. <laughs> fearless, not reckless. Um, you know, as a little kid, I had to learn how to walk through fear. Um, the only way I got to the point that I could, in competition, launch myself 20 feet into the air, land and ski through a minefield of bumps that were as big as I was, was by standing behind that jump, a hundred times, shaking with fear and doing it anyway. Courage is a muscle and we need to, I needed to constantly um, work it and build it and do things that scared me. And, um, you know, but not recklessly. <laughs> um, the next play in the playbook was, um, let, I needed to get to a point where I really liked myself again. I had lost, I had lost my way and I'd become someone that I wasn't proud of at all. I was, you know, doing things that were so, such a departure from my moral center. And what happened was I stopped liking myself and I stopped fighting for myself and things fell apart. So the, the pivotal moment for me 
was the first time I walked into Jim Walden's office for our first work session. You know, I was hot off of the gambling world. And I walked in and I said, okay, Walden, what's our strategy and what's our angle? And he said, Molly, both our strategy and our angle will be integrity. And that was a pivotal moment for me. That was a game changing moment. It, it reminded me who I wanted to be and who I, who I aspired to be as a, as a young girl. And, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of the changes I made after that led to making this choice of I'm going to stick to my moral compass, no matter what is externally outside of me. And, and so that's, what gave me the strength and the power when I was faced with the situation, you can have all your money back and you can have freedom or you can do the right thing, choosing the right thing. But something that I became aware of is that there's two parts of me. There's this part of me that can be very moral and have integrity. And there's this other part of me that can get very greedy and very mercenary. And I need to make sure that I'm constantly feeding this other side. And so a mentor introduced me to this inventory practice which has been very, uh, very transformative in my life. At the end of the, my day, I go over my day, it takes 30 seconds, and I look at how I showed up. Was I all about Molly all day long, selfish and self-serving, or was I in service? Was I um, kind to people? Was I, was I on the bench paralyzed in fear, or was I acting courageously? The answer to these questions shows me the work to stay on the path for good character. And two things happen. I develop an inner confidence and an inner self-esteem that's completely unshakable. And other people start to like me a lot more too, and that's really good for my personal and business relationships. And the last play in the playbook is action. When you're climbing a mountain or climbing your way out of the gutter, it's strenuous, it's hard. I spent years of taking action every day and feeling like each day was a mini failure or a mini setback. But the thing that saved me and the thing that got me out and the thing that has always gotten me there is to completely be in courageous, it's not always courageous, to be in action towards the goal, even when it sucks, even when it feels bad, even when uh, it's one failure after the another, it's getting, it's just this, this, this insistence on not giving up and, and continuing to take action every day. Not thinking, but taking the action. And so that's the playbook. I believe if we are willing to get radically accountable, if we are willing to get still and, and, and look inside, if we are willing to get fearless, if we're willing to stop being jerks, I was being a jerk, not like this, but, but if we're willing to build our character and if we're willing to be in courageous action all the time, then pretty much anything is survivable and thrivable. That's all I got.